Hello and welcome once again. This is our software engineering journey. Um, in the last session, we introduced ourselves to who the software engineer even was. Um, we tried to appreciate his main responsibility, what he does, and um, what entails in um, the career of a software engineer. We even had the privilege to engage with a mentor Google software engineer who took the time and the pain to answer our questions and of course preceded that with a general scope of um, real industry practice of a software engineer. And I hope that edition was um, worthwhile and lessons were learned from that engagement. Um, look out for a lot more um, in the coming weeks and uh, make sure you form part of it. Um, there's some free 10% bonus for your participation. if. Um, grids is all that matters most to you okay right um in this session we are going to look at two main things the agile software development and then requirement gathering at this point in time you have all successfully submitted your project information sheets um, you have a clear idea how you and your team are going to embark on this particular journey and to deliver on your solutions and so we are systematically moving along with these course sessions so that um, by the time we complete it, you have acquired enough experience and knowledge to deliver on these projects. Let me use the opportunity to inform you that we have um, a number of prospective clients who have reached out. Um, and so I'll pretty much be reviewing the project information sheets that have been submitted. And then we'll throw invitation to a few teams to engage with these clients, take their requirements, and then deliver on them, of course. So this will be targeted towards the few um, promising ones, depending on how you put yourself together in your project team information. Right. So this is another recording session right from my home studios. Um, if by the time you're watching this, my team had a frustrating moment yesterday with Benford, but um, we don't lose hope. We'll keep it alive. At least we still remain at the top of the table. But um, that was just by the way. All right, so we hit the nail on the head and um, we just launch deep. So this is session two. We are going to talk about the agile software development and then requirement gathering, re requirement engineering. Of course, requirement gathering entails in this as well. Um, this section focuses on the chapters three and four of the key text and so um before you are, before you watch this video you are expected to have completed this reading assignment and then um the the video will just you know add a bit of clarity to some of the things you're going to read because these are just going to be highlights of areas that we consider very important there are some examples that have been cited um scenarios that have been used to explain the concepts that have been that we are we have been discussing all this while as far as the key test is concerned and it will come in handy to be quite important if you can accustom yourself to these things now depending on whichever week we find ourselves each of the mentors we are having subsequently will be you know highlighting bringing into perspective their um practical experience as far as those sections are concerned and so they all come in handy so that you can pick a bit of few of information from them um, so make sure you have synchronized your email your ug email with your um, respective handsets or whichever means possible probably check as quickly as often as possible so that when the meeting is scheduled and the information is sent across you will not miss out it's very very important so this section we're going to highlight more on the agile software development approach which we literally expect you to adjust to because that is the order of the day, not necessarily waterfall model. So over the years, students do project work and um, they describe their project have, as having undergone waterfall model. To, you know, obviously you come to realize that they don't know exactly what they are talking about. Because if they understood the whole concept of software engineering, they realize that waterfall model is pretty much a cake. But the requirement gathering will come in handy because before the next deliverable you are expected to have engaged with your client at least a couple of times he heard him or her out and then understood the requirement the person wants you should be able to appreciate the kind of questions he's going to 
ask you and particularly the kind of questions you would need to put forward so when you hear the narrative what do you look out for how do you you know in, um, internalize this information and bring them into fruition and of course practically present this solution to your client at the end of the day so this session we're going to focus on the HR software development and then requirement engineering now let's just look at the big picture here let us look at the big picture here um, there is rapid development and delivery of solutions today um, businesses from my experience okay and I will make reference to my experience because until I got into the corporate world, much of what we have been discussing, I had ideas about them, I had watched videos on them, I had heard people talk about them, but when I had a hands-on experience, I appreciated it the more. And that is why you'll be engaging with these mentors eventually. So you'll be looking out for some of these things because you presently, you are a student, okay? So um, my client, one of my clients, which was a financial institution, Probably some of you are wondering which client it was. Um, I wouldn't want to mention any, but maybe I may mention it one of these days. The only clue I can give you is they couldn't survive um, the times because um, they were insolvent. They were considered insolvent, and so they, lose, they lost their license. I lost some money, of course, in the process because we had some agreements, but it's all part of it. The experience matters most, and today here I am trying to share this knowledge with you and bring it into practicality, the concept that we are learning. But the point I'm trying to draw home here is that, um, you know, these financial institutions are regulated by bodies. So they are not independent on their own. They need to follow certain uh, rules. They need to comply. They need to, they need to adhere to certain compliance and other stuff like that. And so um, you, they don't just put out functionalities and then get a software engineer to just push the solution out there for them as they want. The, the engineers must make sure that they make these institutions um, sustain their compliance as far as the regulatory body in that setting is concerned. I hope the, the, the point I'm trying to drive home here is very clear. Now, another thing that we realized was that in, a, in an effort to have a competitive edge and stay ahead of the game, um, anytime management had their meetings and, you know, and reviewed uh, progress of one unit or one department etc they would come up with certain conclusions that okay initially this is what we wanted but um, we want to move in this direction engineers how do you make this thing happen we need to do this so that we can stay ahead of the game all of these situations um, come to play and they eventually you know require that engineers adjust accordingly because then if your clients are not going to make business you are also not going to stay in business depending on the kind of agreement that has been established right from the onset so these are some of the things that we are trying to bring into perspective here the big picture so businesses are actually operating in fast changing requirement and it is actually practically impossible to produce a very stable software if you are going to catch up on all of these <clears throat> so excuse me right so the point we are trying to drum home here fundamentally is that software has evolved quickly and to continue to evolve simply to meet changing business needs and that is the reality of the matter and that is why we are going to drum home the main approach to software engineering as we recommend for you and we want to expose you to and that is going to be the main focus it's going to be at the center stage of the subsequent engagement that we are going to have and that is no none other but the agile development methods HR development methods. We made mention of several methods earlier on. Um, the planning based method, um, the waterfall model, etc. etc. There were several of them we made mention of in the previous session. And if you made conscious effort to read, complete the reading assignment, I am pretty sure um, this will not be any news to you. Now, this HR method actually emerged way back in the 1980s. And the main reason was to make sure that you know we, we 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 reduce delivery time for working on software systems because um if you're going to follow the waterfall model the the fact of the matter is that you're going to literally um spend so much time to accomplish one stage get get it over and done with move to the other stage by the time you get to even the the fourth stage a lot of things might have changed and we may have to go back to the beginning and you know start afresh several constraints and of course by the time the whole solution is ready even for clients to 
take hold of it and utilize it a whole lot of time and money is gone and wasted the business the business may not be the same as before okay so um it becomes necessary to acquaint ourselves with the agile development methods which evolved just 1990s i'm pretty sure some of you were probably born by then i don't expect and assume that everybody was born after the the 2000s yeah but if you're in the 2000s also okay shout out to you great right so what 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 is the clear difference between the agile development method and the others that we have spoken about um in the past there are several of them so you notice that we have program specification and design program specification um design and implementation all of these things are interlinked that's the the word we use there they are interlinked so um you have uh the the program specification can take different shape depending on business changes that may, that might occur management meets and they make some decisions and we have to adjust accordingly so they're interleaved design design we, we probably would have been on the design phase but then due to one event or the other we may have to go back to the program specification again to make some adjustments we may even be at the implementation stage and we may have to go and tweak some few things on the design phase you know so there's a back and forth in in this whole exercise as far as the agile development method is concerned and that is why we refer to it as interleaved okay so you take notice of that um so in a sense we are saying that it, the solution eventually the software is engineered in series of frequent versions and increments so if you have been very observant, you realize that most of the applications we have on Play Store and so on and so forth, you, you, are, you are required to even update your application over a period of time. Even the operating systems have fallen victims to this kind of scenario. And it's not going to change tomorrow or change today. It's going to keep, up, keep on changing and we all have to just adjust. And that's why we have to psych you up rightly so that you'll be in the right frame of mind to adjust and accustom to the demands of the corporate world as far as software engineers are concerned so the point you're trying to draw home is you realize that microsoft will give you a version of its operating system windows 10 version so 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 so, so, so windows this uh, version so those of you using the macbook we we had catalina some time ago today we are talking about big uh, even that one we have version one point something something and then version what you know that sequence and series i'm pretty sure um i'm making it a bit more um imaginative for some of you so um that is the whole point if we talk about agile development methods we are literally going to deliver these solutions in frequent versions or probably in increments increments here means that that's why we're using or they are never the same in versions or increments because um some of you your clients are making so much demands of you the solution is nearly impossible to deliver within the nine weeks that we have which one week is already gone and spent and which well i wouldn't want to use the word wasted pardon my words because you've all done a marvelous job by adjusting to the demands of the previous week. So the point I'm trying to draw home is, so you take some of these requirements in, which we're going to delve deeper into, break them into phases. So you deliver them in an increment approach. Okay. So it's either you are, we are releasing frequent versions or we are, you know, increasing, we are delivering the solution in increments. Increment is no new word to everybody in this class by now. Um, especially when we want to perform iteration in any programming sequence so this is no news to you so we are just playing around with our own vocabularies right so this is one typical characteristic of agile me development methods as a matter of fact it is important to also acknowledge the fact that stakeholders are involved in some of these version specification and evaluation because engineers don't get up and change things of course there are instances where we feel technology has changed I was telling some students some time ago, they asked me, so said, can we have access to your application you developed in, way back in 2009, as I've been quite vocal about. Uh, unfortunately, I still have my files. I actually zipped them, you know, back in the day, you did what you could do. But unfortunately, Google is telling me that some of my scripts contains some malware, etc. The file is still right there, but they won't let me download it. Um, I, give it I gave it a shot a couple of times trying to retrieve it, but... I, th I think I lost time, but I will keep pushing. If I get it, I will let you know. But that was the whole point. Okay. So um, th th that solution actually exists and 
we expect you to adjust now the point i'm trying to draw home here is with that solution for example um after assessing the whole project realize that it was going to be too big and too difficult to even deliver within the period we needed to do the project work so i had to break it to phases and then just focus on one phase and deliver on that particular solution it was a multi-campus uh, management system for a tertiary institution and i used my institution as a case study back then University for Development Studies Navongo Campus. It's no longer the University for Development, Development University for Development Studies Navongo Campus. It has now assumed a different name so far. The UDS is now only in um, Tamale, right? So stakeholders are actually involved in version specification and evaluation. They must all form part of the conversation. Usually in such scenarios, that's what that's the role they play um such solutions also get extensive tool support and so um uh, where they don't exist developers must put in place testing tools so that when we are delivering it in versions or in increments we use this to support the development we do and we run it against the test we get some results and we move on i told you some time ago if i were teaching your programming courses i probably would have put together some codes testing codes so that when you submit your work to github or the github classroom it will run against the test to confirm and then of course go ahead and grade accordingly so um, that is one characteristic of agile de development methods if anybody says he's developing an agile he's developing a solution and using the agile method and there are no automated testing tools or testing tools that person is lying probably he's doing something else he's not he doesn't even know what is going on Another characteristic of agile development methods is the minimal documentation. I mean, how do you focus on development and then spend time as well putting together a voluminous document? There is little or no time for this particular kind of exercise. So um, the importance of one, one, one benefits or characteristic of agile development method is the fact that engineers are able to focus on working mode um, be able to focus on working code so that they get the functionalities out there for their clients so that business moves on right so this is just to put us in the right frame of mind as we um put uh, we, we narrow the, the lenses on we focus the lens on agile development method now this pretty much seems like a plan approach of delivering the solution yet we say there's a clear difference between the plan method and then the agile development method so what are the differences that we are trying to highlight here okay so look at this we have these two there we have the plan driven development approach or method and then we have the agile development um, method as well now if we pick one after the other you know the plan obviously has three stages as you can see over here um just in a nutshell let me narrow the focus on it okay as you can see over there so um with the plan driven um approach you know to software engineering it is based around separate development stages so we have outputs to be produced at each of these stages and then planned in advance we anticipate every one of these stages and output that we expect and then we plan advance what to do and what not to do okay it's not necessarily waterfall model for that one you know it's not necessarily waterfall model which has different stages okay um if you look at plan driven we have incremental development which is actually possible um iteration occurs within activities similar to the agile approach so we have the engineering um, so what we do literally is that we you can engineer requirements then further on focus i mean um deduce your requirement specification then we can design and implement but depending on the situation we can go back to requirements change as far as requests are concerned but at every stage we have requirements engineering specification design and implementation we can even um iterate this particular stage as you can see over here all right, so then how does the agile development stand out in all of this? Okay, so in the agile development 
specification design implementation and testing all of these things are interleaved as we made mention of earlier and then the output from the development process i decided through the process of negotiation okay during the software development process so that is pretty much the difference and that's how come we have only two images to demonstrate this for you to see we have the requirements engineering we have the design and implementation so while the process is still ongoing we try to um, negotiate outputs in that sequence and that is where the automated testing tools come in really 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 handy okay all right so um we hope this has um sunk deep in so um even to add more to these things the other relationship between this plan base and the agile development is that you know in the case of the um, by and large we said that most projects include elements of plan driven and agile processes the fact that we have clear distinctions between them does not mean we don't use them we, the, we, we, there's no occasion that we can put the two together it's possible it does happen okay so because the instances becomes difficult so deciding on the balance depends on actually many technical human and organizational issues these factors must come in here yes um, and so um, those are things that we need to um, adjust accordingly so let's talk more about the agile methods now that we have put the plant-based um, sideways um, so how did it even evolve in the first place we've spoken about this briefly that this emerged actually in the 1990s but the truth about the matter is that there was a huge dissatisfaction with the overheads involved in the um, software design methods dating from the 1980s to 1990s as has been um, documented okay and this led to the creation of these agile methods now these methods focused on the code rather than the design that's the important thing they were based on iterative approach to software development take notice of these things and they were intended or should i say they are intended to deliver working software quickly and evolve this quickly to meet changing requirements and that is the fundamental thing about agile methods which we must all take notice of now what is the main aim of agile methods the main aim of agile methods is to reduce overheads because that was the problem that was detected between the 1980s dating all the way back to the 1990s so you can imagine that was a whole century um, a whole decade of constraints in the software engineering um, arena so the aim of the agile method is to produce overheads in software process all we are trying to do is we limit documentation and then we try to be able to respond quickly to changing requirements without excessive rework we need to be strategic in all of these things so what is the main manifesto of the agile software development um it's quite simple and um, straightforward we are recovering we are uncovering better ways of developing software and by doing it we are trying to help others also doing it and through this work these are the values that have been understated and we just need to adjust to them you know know this individuals interactions over process and tools we value them we also value working software over comprehensive documentation we also consider or value customer collaboration over contract negotiation and then we respond to change over following just a direct plan these are the four manifesto of um, agile software developments so that is while there is value in terms of um, items on the right we value the items on the left more it doesn't mean we do not want to follow plan it doesn't mean we don't want to um, have a contract negotiation it doesn't mean we don't want to focus on documentation it doesn't mean we ignore processes and tools however the items on the left are much more important to us so what do we mean by some of these things let's talk about them in the national you know let's break them into bits and pieces so we'll pick one after the other shall we so we can talk about um customer involvement as a principle of agile methods customer development as one of the principles of agile methods okay so customers should be closely involved okay that is the point they should be closely involved throughout the development process and their role is to provide and prioritize new system requirements and to evaluate iteration of the system you you, you don't 
engage with your client one week and the next time you speak to the client is a year or several months later okay so we, we need to come to terms the uh, development approach must be agreed upon by between you and your clients before you even strike any um finalize any you know terms and so on and so forth it becomes important it's a different story when you are engaging with a complete um naive client but um if you meet a level-headed person most of these organizations have persons with a minimum it background who you you can reason with even if they, they are not in that particular space we still have to find a way to engage and interact with them so that we come to terms with it because it is no agile method if the customer is not involved then we also have to consider the incremental delivery okay where the software is developed in increments with the customer specifying the requirements to be included in each increment it's very very important okay the customer will specify the requirement to be included in each increment so what i typically will do is that i will first in the first couple of meetings with the client i take all the information they speak most of them will speak english to you others will give you a long gist of statements especially if it is some of these ngos giz and so on and so forth now we come to internalize it and then we'll break them down into functionalities and non-functionalities um specifications as we can understand and then we take it back to them so that we literally make sure we are on the same page as far as this is concerned so please take notice of that increment incremental delivery and another point we need to drum home here is that we need to focus on the people and not the process focus on the people and not the process the skills of development of the development team should be recognized and exploited i did a sample review of some of the submissions of the project sheet information and you know i'm impressed with the way some of your some of the teams have defined and described their members um they highlight the key who the team leader is their proficiency the languages they are quite proficient in um some of the circumstances they have even highlighted their experience in some of these technologies so that if a client should read this he is confident that he's in safe hands are you getting the whole point it's very very essential the focus is on the people and not the process so the skills of the development team should be recognized and exploited team members should be left to develop their own ways of working without prescriptive prescriptive processes we should also be we should be mindful of embracing to change embracing change embracing change and that is very key and important to agile methods we should expect requirements to change in several ways so design systems that can accommodate these changes i'm engaging with a client and i'll be signing this project also to another team to work on the team that will be that will appear to be very promising because this client is quite important to me so you we, we they they they, they, they are they are going to change in the faces you need to accommodate changes in their solution because um if the so the client is not going to if you don't want to be the same person performing updates for your client on a regular basis you need to make sure that they may want a static website but the question you need to ask yourself is who will be changing the banners who will be changing the vision if you the, the need be quite i mean the need be who will be changing the even just a logo if that is what they want to do you know these are questions that we need to ask in the beginning you could pick probably um uh, some templates from team forest and then dump it there but progressively you would need to adjust to their needs and probably develop another back end so depending on their requirements you probably need to deploy some apis custom apis whether you're going to go the native java or probably go to use php or probably node j um, node.js of course then you pro pro provide these api endpoints such that we have an admin side of your the, the, the application and then we have the end user in this case i'm looking at the front end users even though the other side of the admin is also a front end but they had the case admin can change the banners and it will reflect on the main site logos etc etc so you should be able to have an open mind when you are engaging with your client be ready to embrace change and design a system that can accommodate these changes then you are in business for a long time facebook evolved in 2007 and is still relevant today in 2021 youtube is not the same youtube as it was years ago when it started but it's still relevant now 
the face of it is not the same as you see even even just yesterday and today facebook has added a tile it looks like google so that when you go there you have access to all the settings and the tools that you want so it has those dot 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 the color code is just quite different but these are things that they have put in place so that there's a progressive accommodation of changes as and when they need be you can also not proceed with agile method without maintaining simplicity focus on simplicity in both the software being developed and in development process wherever possible we say that actively work to eliminate the complexity from the system stay as simple as possible stay as clean as possible but of course make your application appealing so what is the applicability of some of these things that we are talking about you know um how realistic is these agile methods that we are talking about now the, 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 the applicability here is that product development where a software company is developing a small or medium product this becomes relevant and we can use the agile method to deliver on this um, custom system development within organization where there is a clear commitment for the customer to become involved in the development process and where there are not a lot of external rules you know back and forth with regulations that can affect software agile method can sit in there perfectly and then of course because sometimes their focus is on small tightly integrated teams there are problems in scaling agile methods to large um, systems so these are the three main things that we can talk about here it doesn't mean that it doesn't have problems it's bedeviled with other problems that we cannot ignore because it can be difficult to keep the interest of customers who are involved in the process they come in they every time again the requirements team from today and tomorrow and no so you should put some measures in place to manage that even though we appreciate the fact that we are going the agile way you need to put measures in place to keep that frequent frequent inter interference because that can also um, um, what do you call it affect progress timely delivery if money is involved your money will be locked up somewhere you may even lose interest in the whole project another problem here is that team members may be unsuited to the intense involvement that characterizes agile methods i have not gone through all the teams that have been put together yet but you know this is a possibility you may not have the right set of team to deliver on these somebody was asking me before this lesson say are we going to use are we going to develop mobile apps are we going to develop websites like hello your client will determine what you do some of you may have to even um, get on new knowledge curve go and learn some new technologies and implement a few things here and there you know but we assume that having taken the programming fundamentals you are in a, you are in a better position now to deliver on some of these things and i mean that's the whole point of the knowledge you are acquiring in the lecture room if if that's not then what else so that is one problem we need to be um, aware of um, another instance another situation is when we have to prioritize changes it can be really difficult okay when you have multiple stakeholders uh, prioritizing changes can can be very very daunting you you will not know until you have experienced it and i don't know whether any of you or teams are going to face that situation but let's wait and see another problem is maintaining simplicity and this will require extra work extra work you know behind the scenes a lot of things might have happened but on the face of it it may look as simple as anything but yeah it's not easy maintaining simplicity um as far as agile method approach is concerned contracts may be a problem and that is another issue we need to drum home um, because as with other approaches to iterative development contracts may be a problem like i said depending on the way you allow room for frequent interference here and there you could be losing money on the side you know but you have to adjust because if you don't complete we don't deliver we will not pay this if you don't get through we will not pay this you know it, it has to be experienced even better so contracts may actually be a problem as um with other approaches to attractive development and that we need to make mention of we cannot talk about agile methods and ignore one very important topic and refer to that topic as the extreme programming extreme programming extreme programming perhaps um, the best known and very influential agile method is the extreme programming there are others but we're starting with this one extreme programming now this takes an extreme approach like we have chosen the word 
to iterative development. So we have new versions that may be built several times per day. We can have increments that are delivered to customers every two weeks. And we can have all the tests that must be run for every build. And then the build is only accepted if the test runs successfully. Extreme programming. So it moves in this particular kind of cycle. Okay. Um, you select the user stories for this release. You break down the stories into tasks. And then um, you break down the story into tasks. Then you plan a release. Then you develop and integrate the test software. You release the software. You evaluate the system. Now, if it is, there's the need to make any adjustment or requirement change, then we will have to um, get back here and then select a user story. And then um, we'll repeat the whole process and then we'll move on like that. In the course, um, what do you call it? In the in the um in the course project documentation i've given you some of these key terms i have provided links for you to go and read more on them user stories etc etc um if you read the key text too you will be acquainted enough with what you need to know and what next steps to actually take so let's look at a typical example of uh not just as an example let's see how extreme pro, um, what do you call it programming support agile principles and um, it will become it's, it's it will become necessary to um, look into that as well how extreme um, agile development um, supports uh, extreme programming supports agile principles okay now we have several ways it supports it several ways in several ways so we have the incremental development where it's supported through small and frequent system releases um, customer involvement meaning full-time customer engagement with a team with a team this works fine as well so a stream programming approach as you saw in the chat contributes largely in this particular manner as well then um, people not um, processing through pair programming collective ownership you know and the process that involves long working hours you know this way extreme programming comes in here it's it's, it's still a component of the agile method okay it's not exclusive and then when we have change supported through regular system releases it fits in there perfectly and if you want to maintain simplicity through constant uh, refactoring of code um, that also works handy. If some of these terms are new to you, you may want to look them up, but it's important you get the clear knowledge and understanding of this. We'll be talking about some of these terms as we make progress. So, um, what are some of the uh, influential extreme programming practices? Uh, well, it actually has a technical focus um, and it's not easy to integrate with management practice. Um, and that is one thing we need to know in most organizations. So while agile development uses practices from extreme programming, um, the method is originally defined and it's not widely used. Please take notice of it. So some of the key practices of the ex extreme programming comprises um, the user stories for specification, refactoring. So we're just going to highlight on some of these things. Now, what do we mean by user stories? In the case of user stories, um, in, the, in the extreme programming, a customer or user is part of the extreme programming team. Your customer is not a different entity from the development team. He is part of the extreme programming team and is responsible for making decisions on requirements. Please take notice of that. He is responsible for making decisions on all requirements. So these user requirements are expressed as user stories or scenarios. Please the, take note. They are expressed as user stories or scenarios and this is very very important so they are written on cards and the development team will break these things down into implementation tasks it's very important so these tasks are the basis of the schedule and then the cost estimates so the customer chooses the stories for inclusion in the next release based on their priorities and then the schedule estimates please take notice it's very 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 important now i'm looking out for some of these user stories 
as you continue progressively report on your engagement with your client is very very important now what is refactoring i made mention of it a while ago now there's a conventional wisdom in software engineering um which is to design for change design for change and it is worth spending time and effort anticipating some of the changes um since it reduces cost later of course in the life cycle so um extreme programming however will try to maintain all of that you know that is not worthwhile as changes cannot be reliably anticipated so um it proposes constant code improvement constant code improvement and that's what we refer to as refactoring refactoring just to make changes easier when they have to be implemented so please take notice of that so programming teams will literally look for possible software improvements and then make these improvements even um, where there is no immediate um, need for them so please take notice of that and this by way of doing improves the understandability understandability of the software and so reduces the need for documentation as well still look talking about agile okay um changes in this regard becomes very easy to make because the code is well structured and clear you have commented every line etc your functions are strategic your methods are important your methods are put together your classes are okay you know to look into the future how about if you be cognizant of the fact that some changes require architectural refactoring um and that can be much more expensive but that's a um, conversation for another day Another component, another way um, extreme programming practices um, influence agile development is the test first development. Test first development. Now, testing is central to uh, extreme programming, and extreme programming has developed, you know, an approach where the program is tested after every change has eventually been made. So, what entails in this test-driven development? Because in this test driven development, we have also customer involvement here. But you let's deal with the test driven development. Now, writing tests before code clarifies the requirements to be implemented. And I made mention of this so that if I was teaching you any programming course, I explained to you that I would have written test codes so that when you write your code and you submit, it will run against your course. And then just to be sure, you know, that sort of thing. In the same way, we, the same practice, I came up with, I, I, I got exposed to this approach because I went to the corporate world, okay? And we had to do this on a regular basis. So you write tests before code clarifies the requirements to be implemented. And tests are written as programs rather than the data so that they, they can be executed automatically. It's important. So the test includes the check that has executed correctly. So we usually rely on the testing framework. Um, we can talk about Janet. You can look it up um, all previous and new tests are run automatically when the new functionality is added so that you check and make sure that the new functionality has not introduced any errors it is very important else you'll be in bad business <laughs> especially when you go into production mode then we have the customer involvement so the role of the customer in the testing process is actually to help you develop acceptance for the tests okay for the stories that are being implemented in the next release of the system so you need to involve a customer the customer in the test first development and that is how come i i insist that your client will have a say in your final grade because if your client is not satisfied what is the point okay so the customer who is part of the team writes the test as development process and all new code is therefore validated to ensure that this is what the customer needs so um, i'm expecting that as you provide surveys per each weekly deliverable um i'll be expecting some team members rather writing the tests for some the project you're embarking on and so on and so forth i'm not expecting one person two people three or just four people out of seven to be the ones pr producing this solution learn and catch on because this is what is going to put food on your table after school that's the whole point so please take notice of it and um, people adopting the customer rule have limited time available so they cannot work full time with the development team they come and go as and when they need to so they may feel that providing the requirement was enough of the contribution and so may be reluctant to get involved but you need to get them involved in the testing processes 
So this is about the test first development as far as the influence of extreme programming practice really is. We can also talk about pair programming. Um, pair programming. Now, pair programming actually involves um, programmers working in pairs. You know, um, you know they, they they work together, developing the code together, and this helps develop common ownership of the code and spread knowledge across them. It's very important. It serves as an informal review um, process as each line of code is looked at by more than one person. If you can recall, um, when we engage with Kenny during the mentorship session, he explained that when he received the task and he writes his code, as at the time we were speaking, he was waiting for a review of his code by colleagues and so on and so forth, so that when they don't see anything wrong with it, they move on. This is exactly what we are talking about, pair programming. It plays out well in the real world so you take notes of it so it encourages refactoring as the whole team can benefit from improving the system code you are never alone you need to learn from each other even if you don't know any coding at all which is also unacceptable at this particular point in time great great so in pair programming programmers sit together at the same computer to develop the software okay um pairs are created dynamically so that all the team members who work with each other join the development process. You were privileged for me to allow you to select members of your own teams. But in the real world, you don't get to select and choose who you want to work to work with unless you are in the particular position where you can command, you know, something. So the sharing of knowledge actually um, that happens during the pair programming is very important. It really reduces overall risk of the project when a team member leave. It's very important. So what happens when one person leaves? That way it ends. So many companies would have collapsed if they, were not, if they didn't approach things this way. You know, so pair programming is not necessarily inefficient. And there is some evidence that suggests that pair programming actually working together is more efficient than two programmers working separately. It never, never works that way, please. So please take notice of that. And that is what leads us into the conversation of what we refer to as the scrum agile scrum agile approach of developing solutions this point is very 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 important now this approach is a general agile method but it focuses on managing iterative development rather than specific agile practices so there are three phases in scrum three major phases we have one the initial phase which is the an outline of the planning phase where you establish the general objectives for the project and then design the software architecture. Then we have the sprint cycles. And so you would notice that in your course projects, there are about three or four sprints weekly, which I would expect you to deliver on certain things progressively on whatever you are delivering for your clients. So we have the series of sprint cycles where each cycle develops an increment of the system, an increment. So we don't expect you at every stage of the sprint to be at the same level as you move further. It, 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 it shouldn't happen that way. We should make progress, okay? So the project closure will climax it all, where we wrap up the project and then complete all the required documentation, such as the system um, help frames and the user manuals and access, access the lessons learned from the project. So this is what the Scrum all requires. So if you listen to this conversation, you will notice that that is exactly what we have, have put together and I'm expecting from you. Because then at the end of the day, you must also provide manual for your client in the long run. So by way of diagram, it's something pretty simple. Okay, so we have an outline planning. If you look, as you can see in the image right there, outline, you outline the planning and architectural design. Then you access, select, develop, review. Access, develop, select, develop, review. This is what happens in the sprint agile, the sprint cycle. And then the last phase will be the project closure. It's simple and straightforward like that. So please take notice of that. So what actually entails in the sprint cycle? Now, um, I'm doing something in an orthodox way, but I I'm only we are all constrained by time. And so there's nothing we really can do about this. The point is that sprints are fixed lengths, normally two to four weeks. So in the real world, uh, sprints are just every two weeks or three or four weeks. 
but in the case of your team project works i have restricted you to do um present four sprints in four weeks so almost every week there must be some report and some submission because of the time constraints we find for ourselves but this is what happens in the standard practice in standard practice in the real world they correspond to the development of the release of the system in extreme programming so the starting point for the planning is actually the backlog product backlog product backlog this is just a list of work to be done on the project a list of work to be done on the project i've actually provided a link to this product backlog for you in the course project if you need clarity you can follow that link and it will take you to a page where you can read a lot more okay so the selection phase involves all the team project team who work with the customer in this case who is the product owner to select the features and the functionality to be developed during the sprint so wisdom can never be in one person's mind that's why you must work as a team not two or three people can be designated to go and meet a client it has to be the whole team so once these are agreed the team then organize themselves to develop the software and during this stage the team is relatively isolated from the product owner and of course the organization as well so with all communications channeled through the scrum master the scrum master now communicates progress with the, the product owner and that is where i expect somebody nominated as a scrum master it doesn't necessarily have to be the team leader of any project okay but somebody can double up for those two processes so the role actually of a scrum master is to literally protect the development team from external distractions I play that role significantly with my team so that you don't get anybody from my organization coming to request for one thing or one other. No, no, you don't. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So you must understand your roles and your positions in that particular regard. However, you maintain your sprints engagement and get the best out of your team and get the result that is needed. Okay. So at the end of the sprint, the work done, at the, at the end of the sprint, the work done is reviewed eventually and then presented to your stakeholders or the product owner okay who part of this so we have velocity which is calculated during the sprint review and this provides an estimate of how much product backlog the team actually can cover in a single sprint so this is actually what i'm trying to look out for even at this level how much can you complete it in a week so that you know yourself clearly especially now before you even make certain applications and enter into certain spaces. Another thing is that understanding the team's velocity will help you estimate what can be covered within a sprint and also will provide the basis for measuring and improving performance. And then the next sprint cycle begins thereafter. So um, the, the flow is quite simple. We review the work done. We select the items, we plan the sprint, we move into the sprint everybody does what you're supposed to do the scrum approach then there's a sprint review again then we'll go back again so we have the product backlog playing a role here then we have the sprint backlog also playing another role here and then potentially shippable software probably after that particular last sprint we don't need to go and review another sprint again we just de deploy this because that is the thing we find ourselves great so the Scrum Master here, he is very important. Huh? Allow me to use the idea. Okay, he's a facilitator who actually arranges short daily meetings, what we refer to as the daily scrums. So the, he tracks the product, um, the backlog of work to be done, the records decision, the measures, progress. He measures progress against the backlog and then communicates with the product owner and then the management outside of the team. Uh, you, you you should understand when you form part of a team like this in the real world or in the industry but that is literally what you do then the whole team will now attend daily scrums where all the team members share information describe their progress since the last meeting the problems that have arisen and what is planned for the following day you tell us your challenges <laughs> it's it become frustrating when after a series of prints sprints a developer is still at the same stage um you may be served with a second order um, if th that becomes the situation so please take notice of that so what are the advantages of scrum agile approach of getting things done and the product is broken down into sets of manageable and understandable chunks so it's easier to manage them than looking at the big picture um, unstable requirements do not hold up 
progress, a progress of the project because we we are, we have broken them into chunks and events can still happen even one is um, holding us down at another end. The whole team also have the visibility of everything and consistently, you know, the consequently we have team communication improving. Okay, so we know which stage we are at every point in time. Um, another benefit here is that customers see on time delivery of increment and also gain feedback on how the product actually works because they are there with you somebody's communicating almost on a regular basis to them and there must be trust between the customers and the developers that must be established and scrum present this this um, establishes this um, um this concept really well that positive culture is created um, and everyone expects the project to be done within a particular point in time. Right, so how do we scale Agile methods? How do we scale Agile methods? Um, Agile methods actually have proved to be successful for small and medium sized projects um, that can be developed by small um, co-located teams. Um, we said that it's sometimes argued that the success of these methods comes because of improved communications um which is possible when everyone is working together yes that point is very true but scaling up major methods involve actually changing these to cope with larger and longer projects where there are multiple development teams um especially in these times that we're experiencing COVID, these teams perhaps are even working in different locations so what do we do how do we get around this particular situation there are two perspectives on scaling agile methods Either you scale up or you scale out. Either you scale up or you scale out. Now, using agile methods for developing large software systems can not be developed by a small team. No. If it's a large project, you can't do it with a small team. And for large system development, it is not possible to focus only on the code for the system. No, it's not possible. So you need to do more upfront design and system documentation. So you have a cross-team communication mechanism that have to be designed and used. We should actually involve phone and video conferences between the team members. And then um, this has to be frequent, short electronic meetings where the teams will update each other on progress. And continuous integration where the whole system is built every time any developer checks in their change is actually practically impossible in some of these situations. So it becomes essential to maintain frequent system builds and then regular releases of the system. So this is what we mean by the scaling up approach. This That's one perspective. And then we have another perspective which we refer to as scaling out. So how agile methods can be introduced across a large organization with many years of software development experience is what I refer to as the scaling out. So project management in this case who do not have experience of agile uh, methods may be reluctant to actually accept the risk of a new approach. So large organizations often have quality procedures and standards that all projects are expected to follow. And because of their bureaucratic data, they are likely to be incomplete, incompatible with agile methods. And that is the reality. So agile methods seem to work best when the team members have relatively high skill level and no small things, you all know. So within these large organizations, there are likely to be a wide range of skills and abilities, and they may be cultural resistance to agile methods, especially in those um, organizations that have long history of um, using conventional system engineering processes. So this is just about the um, scaling out bit. Um, the next phase of this particular session, which we're going to talk about, is the requirement engineering requirement engineering so we will take um a breather here and then pause for just a few minutes and resume
Right, so we are back once again, and um, we're going to continue with our discussion, um, our conversation, literally. Okay, so we were talking about um, the Agile software. Um, we're talking about the Agile development approach, okay, the Agile method talking about a whole lot of things and that is going to that's at the center stage of this entire session that we're going to have we journey through this whole software engineering thing excuse me all right now we're going to focus on requirements engineering this is going to be quite short and we're going to get through this as quickly as possible requirement engineering and this is important it's important to cover this before you even engage with your client if you have already met with your client to take you know some of their requirements watching this video may also clarify some few things for you if you have completed the reading assignment then you're also in a better position to um know exactly what to put together and what will go into the development and of course and deliver on what is required of you as far as a team is concerned by the close of this particular week and for, for that matter this particular session Okay, so um, let's look at the big picture here, shall we? Requirements engineering is actually the process of establishing the services that the customer requires from the system and the constraints under which it operates and is developed. Okay, this is very, very important. Okay, the requirements themselves are descriptions of the systems. They are descriptions of the systems. We try to appreciate what the system really are, the constraints that are generated during these requirements engineering processes. So they may range from high level abstract statements um, of a service or of a system constraint to a detailed mathematical functional specification. Um, as much as possible requirements should describe the system, what the system should actually do, but not how it should do it. Please take notice of that statement. As much as possible, requirement should describe what the system should do, but not how it should do it. We'll let you know why as we make progress. Now, there are two kinds of requirements based on the intended purpose and target audience in the concept of requirements engineering. We have the uh, user requirements, and then we have the system requirements. These are two kinds of requirements and they are based on the intended purposes and target audience as far as the solution is concerned. You should be able to distinguish between your user requirements during the requirements engineering and then what your system requirements really are. So when you have high level abstract requirements written as statements in a natural language, you know, when they have diagrams of what services the system is even expected to provide to the system users and then the constraints under which these um, must operate, then you are focusing on user requirements. But when you are focusing on system requirements, then we are looking at a detailed description of what the system should do, including the software system's functions, services, operational constraints. These three things are very, very essential to system requirements. You need to note and obtain this information as you interact with your clients. So the system requirements document, which sometimes is called a functional specification, should define exactly what is to be implemented. It should define it clearly and succinctly and vividly, of course. Okay, it may be part of the contract between the system buyer and then the software developers, but we should be on the same page as far as that is concerned. So by this, we can talk about the classes of requirements. The classes of requirements. We have two main three main classes of requirements. We have the functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and we have the domain um, requirements. We'll break all of these things down into detail, but in brief, you could say that the functional requirements are services, you know, the system should provide, services the system should provide, statements of services statement of services the system should provide how the system should react to particular input and how the system should have uh, should behave you know in particular situations and it may state what the system should not do it may state what the system should not do when you have such an instance when you have statements and that 
that that meets this particular description then we are for, we are talking about functional requirements so these are things i'll be looking out for in your next submission non-functional requirements we have constraints on the services or the functions that are being offered by the system we can look at time constraint constraints on the development process standards and so on it could be a tall list okay these apply to the system as a whole rather than individual features or services so clearly there is a difference between the functional requirements and then the non-functional requirements then the third class is the domain requirement where we have constraints on systems that are derived from the domain of operation not the domain of your at st.ug.ugh i hope that point is made clear so let's break them down you know into bits and pieces so that we appreciate this even more like we said they describe functionality functional requirements largely describe functionality or system services okay statement of services we made mention of that so they depend on the type of software that um they depend on the type of software the expected users and then the type of systems where the software is actually going to be used so we can have functional user requirements functional user requirements don't forget we said that the requirements engineering there are two main types but they are made they are based on the intended use of the um software and then the audience and then we had the system require user requirements and then we had the system requirements now these ones we just mentioned the functional non-functional domain are um they are um what we refer to as the um what name did we even call them we said they are classes sorry about that classes classes of these requirements engineering approaches but as we make progress you could have functional user requirements we could have functional system requirements so this is a combination of the types of the requirements that we can talk about and then um being qualified by the classes under which they fall so don't miss them don't miss them so we can have functional user requirement that may be high level statements of what the system should do and then we can also have the functional system requirements as to what should um, the system services what the system services should literally entail we want to talk about functional requirements we have problems that arise when requirements are not precisely stated if they are not precisely stated there are issues that evolve out of this we have ambiguous requirements that may be interpreted in different ways by developers you know and users and in principle requirements should be both complete and consistent it must be complete and consistent so when we say it's complete it should include descriptions of all facilities that are required you need details we need the bedrock of everything that you want us to do so that we ladder on from there so it's very very important and we must stay consistent there should be no conflicts or contradictions in the descriptions of the system facilities it is very 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 important there should be no contradiction so you must stay consistent so in practice it is impossible to produce a complete and consistent requirement document <laughs> even though we have this standard we are saying that in practice it is impossible to make that happen but yes, we still have to talk about it. Now we've made mention of the non-functional requirements class. You know, we can talk about reliability, response time, storage requirements. These are non-functional requirements, you know, that define the system properties and constraints. We have constraints that are input and output device compatibilities that has to do with that. We have ones that has to do with system uh, representations and so on and so forth we can have process requirement that may also be specified mandating a particular integrated development environment to be used a programming language of choice or maybe some development method all of these things can fall under these non-functional requirements so when you find a year for students funny because they didn't do software engineering they will tell you that um the instead of them capturing the right headings for their their work if they, de they develop a solution and they need to indicate say functional requirement non-functional requirement they're going to write and tell you that um technology used uh, um, some even write windows 8 then requirement they just write requirement this, this 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 there you clearly know that this person did not do software engineering and funny enough all my project students none of them studied software engineering during their academic journey of course they are all it students of course the trend has changed it used to be only cs students but now you you guys in dcit whether it or um 
CS, you are all doing this course, and of course the CS students who are partaking in this. So state what has to be stated, because if we are going to be very, so don't go and look at those project works on the shelves that have developed software and everybody have written requirement, requirement. We are trying to change the status quo. We are changing the narrative. We want you to do the right thing. And that's why I'm taking the time to explain all of these things for you. So we have these non-functional requirements where we discuss all the input and output devices, their compatibilities, etc., etc. You know, we, the IDEs, the programming language, you know, they may be more critical than functional requirements. And if these are not met, the system may be useless. And it's important you acknowledge them and note them as part of the requirements engineering. So you don't only take information from your client, but you also have to come and assess what can be done and what will be used to deliver on these things. And they may fall under these non-functional requirements, especially if they are not stated by your client. They may, if they may affect the overall architecture of the system rather than the individual components. That is true. And we have a single non-functional requirement such as the security requirement that may generate a number of related functional requirements that define system services that are required. That is also possible. And this may also generate requirements that restrict existing requirements. So we, we should have an open mind to this. And that is how come we have this chart here we have used to, um, we are trying to use to explain this whole concept and the conversation that we are trying to generate right here. So you have those non-functional requirements, which can be further broken down into product requirements, organizational requirements, and external requirements. And under each of these subdivisions, we can have um, other divisions like usability requirements, efficiency requirements, dependability requirements, security requirements. Non-functionality requirements can be really broad, but you need to do um, due diligence to deliver on these things. So we'll, we'll, we'll take, we'll highlight on some of these um, breakdowns of non-functional requirements and then um, we'll see where that takes us. We'll take one after the other. So we can talk about the um, product requirements, you know, requirements which specify that the delivered products must behave in a particular way. So we can talk about executed speed, reliability, etc. All of those things fall under product requirements. When it has to do with organizational requirements, we are talking about requirements which are consequence of organizational policies and procedures. So we can talk about standards, process, process standards that might be used, implementation requirements, etc. I made mention of the scenario of my client, who, which was a financial institution. So we have some compliance, some things that has to be followed because eventually people come to audit Bank of Ghana and the rest will come in here and all. You know, so that's very important. Then we have external requirements, requirements which arise from factors which are external to the system and its development process. So we can have interoperability requirements, legislative requirements, etc. If you have had a little experience as I have had, if you engage with MT and Haptel and any final some of these payment gateways, they will give you their requirements as to probably what parameters to pass towards and what response you will get and how you interpret them, a whole tallest of documentation and how you interface with these solutions, they could all fall under external requirements. And you need to appreciate which category of requirement they fall under and organize your documentation in that particular regard. So generally, non-functional requirements really can be difficult to state precisely and of course, an imprecise requirement may be difficult to also verify. So they are stated usually as a goal, okay? A goal, a general intention of the user, such as um, ease of use and so on and so forth. So they should be written as a verifiable non-functional requirement, a statement that is that use some quantifiable metric, you know, that can be objectively tested. So that once it's a goal, you know that you can, as a developer, you can use that to convey your intentions or a system users. So um, non-functional requirements are very, very important. They are very, very important to be acknowledged. The third on the bill is the domain requirements. The domain requirement. Now the system's operational domain imposes requirements on the system. Domain requirements may be new functional and non-functional requirements, you know, constraints on existing requirements or sometimes even they define specific um, competition. So if domain requirements are not satisfied, Okay, then the system may be unworkable. That's as simple as that. So we have two main problems with domain requirements. We have the understandability and then the imp implicitness. Take note of these words, understandability and implicitness. 
um, requirements can be expressed in the language of the application domain, which is not always understood by software engineers developing the system. And that is one problem, and that falls under the understandability. This implicit problem here has to do with instances where domain specialists understand the area so well that they do not even think of making the domain requirement explicit. And that is another unfortunate position that we can find ourselves. But in the nutshell, these are the three main things, functional, non-functional, and then the domain requirements, classes of requirements engineering. Please take notice of that. So what entails in the process? Let's look at the process. Let's take look, let's look at the processes. Now they vary widely depending on the application domain, um, the people involved and the organization actually developing the requirements. These are the three main things. The application domain, the people that are involved, the organization that um, the requirements are being developed for. So in practice, requirements engineering is an iterative process. It's not iterative only in coding, but the process in itself is an iterative one. So we follow some generic activities that interleaves each other. And the first of them is elicitation. Requirements engineering, we have stages. Elicitation, analysis, validation, and management. I repeat, elicitation, analysis, validation, and management. The elicitation analysis actually is one stage where software engineers work with um, a range of system decoders simply to find out about the application, the services that the system should provide, the required system performance, the hardware constraints, other systems, etc. So what are the stages of this elicitation analysis? The first one, we have the um, requirements discovery. You know, now in interacting with your stakeholders to discover their requirements, the domain requirement are also discovered actually on the, at this particular stage. So it's important you try to discover the, 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 the requirements. So that's the requirement discovery. That's why you interact with your stakeholders or your clients. We have the requirement classification organization. So you group related requirements and organize them into coherent clusters. Then we have the prioritization and negotiation where you try to prioritize these requirements and then resolve any requirement conflicts here and there because we want explicit differentiation of one function from the other. And then the specification bit where all of this is documented and then input into the next round of the spiral of the software development life cycle. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, now what entails in the requirements Elicitation once more, we have what we refer to as the closed and open interviews, which most of you are going to embark on. Some of you have already engaged with your clients. I know some teams that have clients in Canada, they had a Zoom session with this client. You know, so we have interviews with stakeholders that are part of the requirement engineering process. We use the user stories and the scenarios that are, you know, real life examples of how the system can be used, which are usually easy for stakeholders to actually understand. Then we have the scenarios that should include descriptions of the starting situation, normal flow of events, what can go wrong, other concurrent activities, you know, the state of the system when the scenario really finishes. So you can have a typical use case diagram like this, where <clears throat> we identify use cases like medical receptionist and a nurse. I have a team of students that are taking their project and when I ask them a question about their um, use cases, they don't even know what kind of question I'm asking. And it's interesting why how software um, IT students who never did software engineering throughout their academic journey want to develop a software and follow software engineering principles. Uh, it must, it's, it's such a frustrating position I find myself, but we are adjusting. What can we do? We can't complain, can we? So we have medical receptionists, we have a nurse, a nurse, we have a manager, we have a doctor. There are instances where your use cases are not even animate entities, especially when you have solutions where applications are talking to each other. Okay, so in this particular scenario, we have the receptionist, what he or she can do, as far as the user story here is concerned here, is that he can register patient, he can view personal information. Manager cannot register patient, but he can view personal information. We are trying to make sure that there is no conflict. That's the point you are trying to draw home here. You should be able to break this thing down clearly, and you should communicate this to your uh, stakeholder so that you are all on the same page 
yet you would have retrieved this information via conversation or an interview okay so the manager can export statistics and it can also generate reports doctor can also generate a report are you getting it then we have a nurse who can view record and then edit record doctor is in a similar position and he can even set up a consultation as well so this is a gives you this gives you a picture of a similar an application for managing a hospital um uh, what do you call it environment just to give you an idea of what we actually expect from you so please take notice of it um requirement elicitation and analysis has its own problems which we cannot gloss over um, sometimes stakeholders don't know what they really want you are going to experience this some of you who have engaged with your clients already have noticed this your stakeholders can express requirements in their own terms and it will not even make sense you can have different stakeholders that may have conflicting requirements you know yes that is also there you meet you meet them you can also have organizational and political factors that may influence system requirements i'm telling you i know firsthand about that bit and most of my colleagues in the department will attest to that and we have requirements that change during the analysis process today he's saying the next day say another thing we've not even hit the ground running yet and in instances where you have new stakeholders that may emerge and then a business environment that could also possibly change so we are not going to be oblivious we also talk about it there are, pro there are always a bad side to every one of these situations then we can look at the requirement specification also we just clear the elicitation bit so that's how you get your information and what should motivate your interaction okay right so um when you are writing down the user and system requirements that is what we refer to as the requirement specification when you have to write down the um the user and then system requirements and the requirements documents and everybody has to put that together and that falls in line with your proposal what i referred to as your proposed solution you know the requirement specification come in handy here they they, they form key to this part of the document <laughs> excuse me so user requirements have to be understandable by end users and then the customers who do not have technical background it has to be as simple as possible okay so the system requirements can be more detailed <laughs> can be more detailed excuse me excuse me um just pause a bit right here Sorry about that momentarily um, break. Um, the nose was trying to misbehave, and this is a live recording, unedited, on cuts, going to be shared right as you see it. Okay, so we're talking about the requirement specification and how relevant it is. So this is where you write down your documents, um, you pen down everything you have elicited from your clients and your stakeholders. Um, it may be part of a contract for system development and it's important that these are completed as quickly as possible and handed in. It helps you be on the same page with your client, appreciating what you're going to do and whether they are already also um, in agreement with what you're going to do. So in principle, requirements should state what the system should do and the design should describe how it does this you can never separate requirements and design please note you can never separate the two um so user requirements are almost always written in natural language what would be my natural language is just plain simple english and it's supplement, supplemented by appropriate diagrams and tables in the requirement document so for example you probably have come up with your use cases diagrams they can fall in line here with your um, requirement documentation so that we appreciate this the use cases or user stories and what each and every one of them can do so this is very very important okay so system requirement may also be written in natural language but other notations 
based on forms and graphical system models can also be used you can have mathematical system models also used um, natural language is actually expressive anybody can just get it the content is intuitive and it's universal so it means that the requirements can be understood by users and customers you should probably go a go with the structured natural language which is a way of writing system requirements where the freedom of requirements writer is actually limited and all requirements are written in a very standard way so the approach maintains most of the expressiveness and understandability of a natural language but it ensures that some of there is some form of uniformity that is imposed on the specification okay so that's just to bring into perspective the natural language point that we raised earlier then you after you have cleared the elicitation and the specification you now go to validation requirements validation so this stage is concerned with demonstrating the that the requirements that have been defined you know the requirements define the system that the customer actually really wants so we have requirements error costs that are high so validation must be considered as high priority and um, what are the problems we look out for validity consistency completeness realism and then verifiability so does the system provide the functions with which best support the customer's needs what's the response to that then you are trying to seek validity consistency uh, are there any requirements conflicts you know then we have completeness also where you ask yourself are all the functions required by the customer included is there anything that not left out then we have realism where we can um, you can ask yourself like can the requirements be implemented you know given available budget and technology you know is that also possible and then can the requirements actually be checked and at this stage you are trying to ver verify um the requirements you have not even gone you have not even started developing this you have not even started the designing and implementation but you need to validate your requirements so this comes in perspective the kind of questions you would expect your client to ask of you what you ask of him in that particular order as you have completed in the other assignment i would have but i would probably give extra credit to those who would ask relevant questions in relation to their client's demand and not necessarily trying to copy and paste some answers they've seen online or rephrase and paraphrase and give them back to me without they not even knowing what they are doing i won't endorse that so um what are some of the techniques of the requirements um validation what are some of the techniques we have uh, the requirements reviews where we can have systematic manual analysis of the requirements okay so we can have regular reviews that should be held while the requirement definitions are being formulated taking into, into consideration all the questions that we asked before and others so is the requirement realistically testable um, is the requirement properly understood is the origin of the requirement even clearly even stated and the requirement be changed without a large impact on other requirements you know these are questions we ask during these reviews and then you can proceed by probably even using getting out there some prototype and using an executable model for system to check requirements um i've forgotten the name of this platform it's online you know we've had instances where students use that platform to create prototypes of whatever they want to do um adobe has an application um i've forgotten the name i've forgotten the name but adobe has an application you can use it to model your web apps your mobile apps and other solutions and make them behave as if they are even functional but it's just to get a prototype out there to be sure we are we we, we know what we want you know you consider all your colors everything you have designed graphics of what is expected you and the client have come to terms with all of these interfaces it's very very essential you don't just get down and start programming you know and that becomes the goal of what you are trying to get out there then we can have the test case generation developing the tests for requirements to check the testability right then we can talk about finally the requirement change requirements change now requirement management is actually the process of managing changing requirements you know during the requirement engineering process and um, system development new requirements emerge 
usually as a system is being developed and after it has gone into use um, reasons why requirements change after the system development well we have instances where the business and the technical environment of the system always change after installation and you can't help it and uh, we have instances where people who pay for a system and the users of that system are really even the same people so they are chatting with this the next day you go back to the establishment and the organization is beheaded by a different person with different expectations and goals you have to adjust accordingly and the last but not the least we have instances where large systems usually have a diverse user community varied numbers i've been a victim of that um, in my past life in the corporate world where the solution we wanted to build is we wanted to be just one full-blown solution however when you go to each assembly to collect revenue the approach of getting things that is different so are you going to develop an application exclusively for each and every one of these? It doesn't work that way, but you have to adjust. In that case, we have a diverse, wide user community, which have to adjust. So if you have many users having different requirements and priorities, that may also be conflicting or contradicting, and that may also necessitate requirement change. Okay, folks. Right, so this brings us to the end of our session, session two. Um, I hope you've heard a lot, you've read enough, and uh, you are psyched up to proceed accordingly. And so, um, let's keep engaging. And um, I would love to know your, um, your opinion about this approach of lessons, where you have the convenience to watch the video at all at any point in time, watching this video from the link that is being shared from the YouTube um i don't mind you know getting to know your comments in the comment section um, trying to make use of the little resource that i have available to me to manage the time so of course the class size that we are dealing with here on that note thanks for your attention and see you in the next session